Uh, good morning. Uh, let's, uh, let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you, Lord, that uh, you are uh, on the throne. We can put our hope and our trust in you. Um, even if uh, things may not be turning out right or uh, perhaps we're challenged, Father, you're with us. You go before us. You're behind us. You're beside us. Uh, Father, let us keep our eyes on you this morning um, it's, it's, uh, and, and, and not be distracted. Father, I pray for you to, to let your word speak to us, Father. Open our hearts to be humbled and, and available to what your Holy Spirit wants to show us. And I uh, just thank you for being on your throne that we can put our trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, how many of you have had at times in life where everything, uh, you know, you've, everything finally uh, was smooth? You know, you're finally on cruise control. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, how many of you, you know, what I'm talking, everything's just finally working out, and there you are on cruise control. And then what happens? Suddenly, a big cow gets in the middle of the road, and you have to go left or right or have lots of hamburger meat. And that, work, that line works much better in Texas. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, that's what happened to me. I was the Western coordinator for an organization back east called Rutherford, and uh, I was coordinating litigation here on the West Coast. And they said, Brad, we're scaling back. We're shutting down all our regional offices. But don't worry, we have a promotion for you. Why don't you head up our public affairs office in Washington, D.C.? And, um, and you'll have a higher salary, larger staff, larger office, and you'll be the, the face of the organization with all radio and television for, for the organization. I, I thought, well, psh, I don't have to pray about this because obviously God's closing one door, opening another door. You don't have to pray about those things, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you get, you know and then I had insomnia. Next night, insomnia. Next night, insomnia. And then I realized, oh, shoot, I got to pray. <laughs> now, why did I not want to pray? I'll tell you why. Because in my life, when I have a, this fork in the road, and there's the easy way, and then there's this other way requiring faith, guess where I'm convicted usually when I pray? The hard way. So, but I had no choice, so I prayed. And when I did, the Lord put this on my mind, which was a question, Brad, what desires have I put on your heart? And the answer was to make sure people got the help where it was needed most here in California. Next question, what am I, get, what am I going to follow? The desires God's put on my heart or something else, like my obsession with security? And uh, my dad was an entrepreneur, and that's all I'm saying, okay? <laughs> Some of you people, ladies in particular, going, yeah, yeah, yeah. So... So anyway, so with, with boldness and courage, I said, yes, Lord, I will go where you're calling me to go. I will follow you where you want me to go. I will do what you want me to do on several conditions. <laughs> it's just what happened. I mean, I'm, and I was scared, right? Because this was totally outside my, my ball game to, to start something. And, and, um, and so I just... I just put it all on the table. By the way, does, does God want us to put it on the table? Does he ever want us to hold anything back? No. Let me ask you this. Um, where do you go in the Bible when you want to be encouraged? When you're discouraged, you want to be lifted up? Where do you, where do you go? Book of Numbers. No, no. Psalms. <laughs> That's more to sleep. No, I'm teasing. Um, but, no, but, but, but Psalms, right? Um, and, why, and you go to Psalms, you go, Let's see. oh, yeah, ooh. Ooh, not this one. Oh. Ooh, ooh, not this one, not this one. Oh, oh, this one, this one right here. We're all guilty of being psalm flippers, okay? We're all psalm flippers. Why are we all psalm flippers? Because David was a man after God's own heart. David put it all on the table. Through the Holy Spirit, it all was out there when he was excited, when he felt victorious, when he felt abandoned, discouraged, Every, he just put it all on the table. And that's what God wants us to do. No matter what we're going through, we have a God that is intimate enough with us and loves us enough and knows us more than we know our own children, right? This is our, our Father, Heavenly Father. He wants us to be open and honest with us. And when we are, God uses that and blesses us. It can even change our perspective at times. So uh, anyway, I was... I put it all on the table. I says, God, I just have a few minor requirements. I want to make sure absolutely this is from you. So I need free office space and definitely donated in Sacramento. 
free computer system donated. You got to keep me on the radio stations for free. There were two at the time that interviewed me weekly. Um, we have to be in the Black God in just three months, and I'm not going to charge anyone at any time for any work I ever do. I thought it was very reasonable with my business plan. So God came through on all of it. And by his grace and mercy, um, he raised it up. Now I'll tell you, he taught me one thing from the beginning. Um, I used to think this was going to be my ministry, <laughs> serving the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what God taught me from day one? This is God's ministry. And by his grace and mercy, presently has Brad Dacus participating at this time. <laughs> and uh, it's so true, so true. If I knew how many times he was going to need to part the waters, I don't think I could have gone forward. I'm just glad he didn't tell me how many, all the things he was going to have to have happen. But uh, it was exciting. And one by one, it was just neat to see how my faith was stretched, how he continued to do his work. Today, fast forward, that was like 25 years ago, uh, we now have um, offices all across the country in, in uh, 16 states, 20 offices in 16 states. And, um, you know, from Miami to Boston, to south of Seattle to Orange County, I mean, in, in many places in between. In fact, our first office, I didn't want to open another office. I, I just thought, we'll just keep in California. I have no desire to grow. Why? I mean, we have plenty of stuff here. And then we start having more cases and more and more cases out of state, particularly in Oregon. We had seven cases in litigation. My church, the chief counsel attorney, Kevin Snyder, who's brilliant, by the way, he told me, he said, he said, look, we, it's, it's cheaper if we just hire an attorney for Oregon. This is costing us so much to fly and hotel and everything and, and time. And I said, okay, well, we only have one person really qualified, and that's Ray Hackey. He's in the San Francisco Bay Area office. Uh, needless to say, his nickname, I gave him his Bulldog um, because he could, the whole world could be screaming in his face and he'd still do his oral argument just fine in court. I mean, he's just really good. But I said, but he's not going to want to move because his family's in the Bay Area. And his wife teaches at a private Christian school, and they're so established. They're not going to want to go to Oregon. I said, well, it was on a Friday. I said, well, let's pray about it over the weekend, and I'll call him on Monday morning, see, see what he says. Monday morning comes, and before I call him, he calls me. And he says, Brad, I know how to say this. I'm just going to say it. I can't stay here. My wife and I, we want to have a house, and with your salary, I understand how PGI pays. I totally get that, but we can't, we can't even buy a shack here on your salary. So but if you want to work for PGI, just let me know. No, no. Anyway, so, um, so he says, I tell you, so we've decided we're going to move, and we're going to move out of state to Oregon. And I said, did Kevin already talk to you? No. Did anyone talk to you at all about Oregon from the office? Anyone? He goes, no, why? We decided on Friday that we were going to have you move to Oregon and open an office for us. He goes, you're kidding. I said, no, serious. This is how God works. Over and over again. In Washington State, we were looking for an attorney up there, partly to defend a, a pastor, minister being prosecuted, criminally prosecuted for preaching the gospel. And so here he is pending prosecution. He says, and he's out there preaching the gospel in front of a courthouse. I mean, he's just going right for the juggler. He's just preaching the gospel. And this, uh, this man, this attorney, is going up the steps, hearing this guy preaching, you know, this, and then stops, turns, listens, and the Holy Spirit convicted his heart. And he walked up and he surrendered his life to Jesus. And that man became, opened the office to defend the pastor who just led him to Jesus. Anyway, praise God over that. It's how God works. You know, about 30% of our cases are criminal defense cases. And everyone we defend has something in common. They're all in ministry. They're all pro being prosecuted for preaching the gospel, or sharing the gospel in public places protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution. And they're, it's all over the country we have these cases now. And uh, the good news is God gives us lots of grace, and we usually win, so which is really nice. But um, there's a lot of, a lot of challenges. Um, 
that we're facing. And, and God comes through and takes care of them all. Our radio program is heard on uh, 720 stations. Uh, more than, no, more than 720 stations across the country, more than 730 stations across the country. And, uh, and it's a really awesome, awesome radio program. I mean, it's, it's my favorite. Okay, it's my show, but it's a good show. <laughs> I'm a little biased, all right. Anyway, but God raises it up, and it's really exciting to recognize it's not that it's when it's his baby and just what he's going to do. And that's the way it is for all of our lives. When we surrender to the Lord and we release it to the Lord, um, God will surprise us. And uh, when we're surrendered to him in his own way and how he works through our lives in, in, in different ways. So did the Apostle Paul have challenges stretching his faith? Oh, yes. And he uh, was a, a, such a model for rising up to challenges. And in, in, in a, his last letter, 2 Timothy, um, he's about to die. And he talks about it's his last letter. He's about to die. He knows he's about to die. And in chapter 3, he addresses, I believe, us. And so turn, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Or you know what? Don't bother. Just, I'm a lawyer. Just trust me. <laughs> yeah, I knew that would get you. I once did that to a church. It was an older church, you know, older, and they didn't laugh at all. They just were flipping real fast. I could tell. You guys got the joke. That was good. So 2 Timothy chapter 3. And how do we know it's to us? Well, verse 1. It says, But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Notice how I say uncomfortable times or might come. No, perilous times will come. It's a promise. And if you're not sure what he means, let's take a look at verse 2. For men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of themselves. By the way, what do, what do they use this for as far as pictures? They take uh, UEs? Theys? No, it's selfies. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, okay? Um, lovers of money. That is so common. Now, it's okay to save. I love IRAs. I was a finance undergrad. IRAs, great. You know, it's a 401k. All, good. Save for the future. But oftentimes, it consumes our life, doesn't it? Money, wealth, things like that. And um, I want you to know, I felt so convicted by this. I went and sold one of my three yachts. No, I'm just teasing. That was good. You guys got that. Okay. I don't have a yacht. But if any of you do have a yacht, I just... I'd love to go on it with you sometime. I'm just telling you. <laughs> they're, 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 they're fun. Okay. Um, lovers of money. Boasters. Proud. What's pride? When we're proud, basically what we're saying is, we're, I'm going to put myself over God. Basically. Right? It's, I know what's best. Blasphemers. Openly defying God. Uh, attacking that which God says is, is good. Uh, disobedient to parents. Some of you have teenagers. <sighs> I'm sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> no, actually, it's the exciting time in life because teenagers are sort of becoming their own in person. They're, they're transferring from uh, childhood to adulthood. They're not adulthood yet. They're no longer children. They're in that transition, right? They're sort of finding their own will and, and all, and, uh, and it's, uh, it can be an experience. Um, but the, uh, but what we're talking about here is actually children turning away from the teachings that they have learned from their parents into something else. You know what the fastest growing religion in America today is? Nuns. Now, I'm not talking about Sally Fields, the flying nun, you know, the, the convent. I just aged myself, didn't I? I just aged, okay. What we're talk I'm talking about here is people who say they're nothing. Say, are you an atheist? No. Be this, no, that, no. I'm just nothing. That's the fastest growing religion. It's moving very quickly, particularly in the younger generations. Very, very quickly. It's people who say basically they don't need God, they don't need faith, they don't need anything. They just think they've got it all together. Uh, and I will tell you, that's not a good place to be um, because uh, it's very easy to discover in the reality of life, that we don't have it all together. and We all, we all need, need the Lord. But that's reality. That's where we're at, our children. Unthankful is the next one. Unthankful. What's the synonym for unthankful? 
Entitlement. Right? If you're entitled to it, do you have to be thankful? I remember once I was buying something and the, the person, the salesman says, well, after all, you, you deserve this. And I said, no, actually, I deserve hell. And I shouldn't have been quite so, you know, <laughs> blunt. Not the most effective. After that was probably a little much for him, you know. It's like. <laughs> but reality, we, we don't deserve anything. It's all God's grace, right? The wages of sin is death. What we deserve is death because of our sin. We don't deserve anything. But our society is one that says, oh, you're entitled to it. Um, I just hope they don't change Thanksgiving to Entitlement Day, you know? It's like, just anyway, just, I think it'll ruin the whole thing. I don't think it'll happen. But unthankful, unholy, unholy is being separate from God, who is holy and righteous. Unloving, unloving, unforgiving, unforgiving. You know, I remember this um, on the uh, news broadcast, and there was a uh, politician who was attacked, and he asked for forgiveness, and the, the people in the audience, they all forgave him, and they all came to, oh, wait a minute, no, I woke up. That was a dream. That's right. Uh, it's, it can be pretty nasty, right? We have a very society that's, that uh, doesn't uh, uphold grace and forgiveness. Instead, it's like, we got gotcha. you, and, uh, and giving no room for that. Slanderers, slanderers. Um, that is so bad. I'm like, in fact, let me tell you about this guy. He was the worst slanderer. His name is, okay, never mind. <laughs> All right, but on bump, you got that one, okay. Um, so slanderers, without self-control. We are so brainwashed to think opposite of this. When I was a child, self-control was good. I really want to eat that ice cream now. No, wait till after, till after you're done with your dinner, then you have your dessert. Now, as an adult, I eat it now, okay? <laughs> but, uh, but no, but self-control is a good thing. Now, if you advocate self-control, involving things that involve temptation, what are you called? A hate monger. You're called a, all kinds of things if you advocate self-control. The, the great deceiver, Satan, has indoctrinated our whole society to think this way. In fact, you, you're going to know it. You're already programmed. Every one of you has been brainwashed. I'm going to start it, and then you're going to be able to finish it. If it feels good, do it. We're all programmed. Every single person here Knew, knew what the answer, what that, the, the final words were. Do it. No, that's giving into temptation is sin, right? But our society is saying, but if you have a desire for it, that's who you are. Just do it. No, that's, that's the deceiver because we all have a desire to sin. You know, in fact, you don't have to teach a child, now let me tell you how to sin. You know, you don't have to tell, a two, a two and a half year old to, to say, mine. Say mine. Mine. No, they do it anyway. I've never met a two and a half year old that says, you. <laughs> you know, it's. So it's, it's a part of our nature. And, uh, and yet our society wants to say, if it feels good, do it without self control. Brutal. Despisers of good. Did not recognizers of good, despisers of good. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. When I was a kid growing up, there were two kinds of people pretty much in society. And there were those that went to church and those be knowing that they should be going to church. And they say, you know, pastor, I'm sorry to get to church this Sunday morning. I just had one brisky too many last night, you know, but I'll be coming on, you know, Christmas when it comes... That was sort of my kind of cultural background growing up. And now you've got those who are followers of Jesus, and you have those who hate followers of Jesus. And our nation as a society, as a culture, has a big rift, division, and it's very deep, and it didn't exist like anything like this uh, when I was younger. And yet it's very, very real today. Uh, and, and it's something we're experiencing from the local level all the way up to the, uh, to, to the United States Supreme Court and the, uh, in Washington. Um, it's very real. It's a spiritual warfare of great intensity. We need to realize the day and the hour of the times that we're in. 
And that's one reason I'm so glad that uh, the Apostle Paul gave this to us, to understand where we are. Uh, it says, uh, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. <laughs> um, this came to the surface in the Supreme Court decision dealing with same-sex marriage. Um, it was uh, interesting to see. It was five to four. Didn't know which way it was going to go. But if they went, in, you know, the, the way that's the unbiblical way, I, I thought it's going to be based on the Equal Protection Clause, based on gender-based discrimination. You're engaging in discrimination on gender if you can't choose which gender you want to marry. That was the, the logic. That didn't surprise me. What surprised me is I continued to read the opinion from the majority, the five-judge majority, and they went on for a, to create a whole new fundamental right. And they said there's a fundamental right for individual sexual fulfillment, end quote. And I'm reading this, and I'm going, this is nowhere in the Constitution. And then I started thinking, what does this mean? What could it mean? And then I was, I was getting blown away thinking, how could they do this? Because the judges, they read each other's opinions back and forth before they release them. So the dissent clearly objected. They said, no, this is what we want. I mean, the majority was very hardcore. And unfortunately, by God's grace, we have three new justices since then, uh, which has shifted the court to a court that's the most pro-religious freedom, most parents, pro-parental rights, pro-life Supreme Court in my lifetime. Praise God. Um, but what the court was effectively doing was taking their fist, shaking it at God, and said, we'd rather be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of you. And it was so clear, and it was so blatant, never before manifest in, in any court case in, my, in history than that case, what the court did, uh, choosing to be lovers of pleasure, uh, lovers of pleasure, rather than lo pleasure rather than lovers of God. Uh, verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying its power. I remember reading this when I was young. I thought, what does that mean? How can you have a form of godliness doing good, you know, right things, and, and yet denying its power, the power of God. What are they talking about? Now we see it real clearly. I was on an airplane once. And by the way, you know those people who just talk and talk, right? You're on an airplane, really annoying, right? Okay, that's me right here, all right? <laughs> it's me. So I'm sitting next to this guy, and I said, you know, faith just always often comes up in my conversations on airplanes, especially when there's a storm and the, and the wings are going like this. And you you won't, don't have to say, admit it, but it's true. We're all afraid it's going to snap off. I know. I'm just saying. So I started talking to this guy about his faith. I said, so tell me, if you don't mind me asking, uh, do you have any kind of religious background or religious beliefs? And he says, well, I'm not religious, but I am very spiritual. We've heard it so much. The, the Satan is just so massive with this one-liner. I mean, he's just... And so I thought... I'm not going to let him off. I'm going to cross-examine him. <laughs> so I said, I said, really? So um, what do you mean by spiritual? And then he says, I just really feel at one and peace with the universe. I mean, once again, it's, you've heard this over and over. And then I looked at him and he says, okay, well, um, well, what else? He goes, that, that's it. <laughs> what? It's like a cloud. It's a vapor. There's nothing to this. Nothing evidentiary, substantive. And yet, as Christians, we sometimes take it for granted what God's given us. We have the holy word of God. More than two-thirds of the prophecy of this book has already come to pass. It's reliable. You can count on it. Um, as far as Jesus, risen from the dead... 12 eyewitnesses, in fact, more than just 12. There was hundreds, right? Um, and from an evidentiary perspective that we know of, of 12, including the Apostle Paul, who gave his life and died for one thing, that Jesus was risen from the dead. Not one, not two. We had a dozen in Roman records validating this. Eyewitnesses. Do you know how valuable it is if you have a case as a lawyer and you have 12 witnesses who are all willing to die for their testimony that X, Y, and Z happened? 
It'd be, it'd be like a dream case. I haven't had a case like that. I haven't had, we've won lots of cases. I haven't had one. That'd be just such an easy dream. In fact, they'd settle before it went to court easily. So we have the, the evidence. And then we have our personal testimonies. I mean, how many of you have seen either yourself or in someone else a transformation of God when they came to Christ? Raise your hand. I mean, it's, this is our testimonies. Um, it's, it's how God works. And, uh, and God's, you know what's also awesome? Is he's still working on us. I mean, this earliest morning, I was a little stressed, right? I was trying to get, where's the handout? So, yeah. God's still working on us. Isn't that great? I mean, we can put our trust in him at all times and, um, and really make a difference. By the way, does everyone, have, as I mentioned, does everyone have one of these? Do you guys want these sign-up sheets? Raise your hand if you don't have one. Okay, a number of you don't. So in the gazebo on the back, if you want to uh, keep up with our cases, feel free to fill this out, and we'd love to keep you updated. There's a little box you can check if you want to uh, be a monthly part of our team and support us. But, um, but the point is, is that in the end of the day, we can have our trust in the Lord because he's given us that evidence, and we don't have to believe in clouds in the sky that are, uh, that are not supported, unsubsidized. And that's a real nice assurance. So, and then it goes on in verse 5 to say, and from such people... Turn away. Now, wait a minute. We're Christians. We want people to come to Jesus, right? Why do we, you don't, we, you turn away? You don't want to turn away. You want to, well, what we're talking about here are people who invade the church to deceive the church, right? That's what we're, we're talking about. And that's revealed from verse six through nine. There's an example in that scripture given for sake of time. I'm going to just skim down to verse 10. Uh, but that's sort of the valid answer to that question. Verse 10 is where we now get the blueprint for the end times to have victory. We just, we just heard how everything's going to go, you know, all this problems and stuff. Verse 10, the Apostle Paul says, now I'm going to give you the, the blueprint on how the game plan, how you can be victorious for the Lord amidst these tarred, perilous times. It says, but you, but you have carefully followed my doctrine. Doctrine is important, right? It's truth, right? Manner of life. Ooh, that's a good one. Purpose. Ah, oh, we all love purpose, right? Solid purpose, who we are in Christ, living for Christ. Faith. Oh, yeah, faith. Awesome. Strength. Long-suffering. Okay, this is where I have a problem. Because <laughs> you know what long-suffering means? Long-suffering. I mean, okay. Then it says, love followed by perseverance, persecutions, afflictions. Okay, whoa. How do you even stick love right after long suffering, persecution, affliction, persecution? It's, it's, how can we love in that situation? I'll tell you, we can't. Humanly speaking, we can't. But when we're in Christ and we have the Holy Spirit and we have the love of Christ, we can love those who hate us. We can love those who persecute us, those who cause us long suffering. And that love, the more we're persecuted, the stronger our testimony and the more evident the love of Christ is. And the world doesn't understand it. The love of Jesus is not in their toolbox. And they've been perplexed. There's been people I've met who've just been totally perplexed because of how I respond sometimes. And they're like, where does that come from? And it comes from the Lord. It's, 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 uh, it's powerful, and God allows us to love. I remember someone once wronged me big time, and I was going to dice and slice him, and I even had Bible verses I was going to use. I'm, just, I'm telling you, I was just going to, you know. And, um, and that's, I mean, I'll, I'll, pray, I'll pray about it, too, for God to really give me the, the sword to just, you know. So I start praying for him. Boy, was that a mistake. No. Then the Holy Spirit starts to convict me of how much God loves him. And I start seeing him as God sees him, as someone who's hurting and in pain and suffering. Because and I, then I come in, I talk to him, I says, you know, how's it going? You know, how you doing? What's going on? And he starts, his eyes water, he says, he says, Brad, why, why do you care about me? I wronged you worse than anyone. And, and, and you're concerned about me? And I said, well, actually, you're really not seeing Brad. You see, I prayed for you before I came in. So really what you're seeing is the love of Christ that God convicted of how much he loves you and how much he cares for you. 
And, um, and that's what God wants us to do. I challenge you, when people are prob- giving you a problem, um, when they come to your mind and they're just causing you torture, pray for them. It's powerful. And Satan hates it, just hates it. And we all have people like that that come into our life, right? They just sort of get you. You start praying, and you'll start seeing them and loving them the way God does, and it's powerful. Perseverance. Perse- persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconum, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Now, we're going to go through persecutions, but you know what? God's going to keep bringing you through it, bit by bit, until it's time for us to go. Right? He's going to deliver us. Now, who am I talking about? You know, well, just probably only about 1% of us really do this. No, 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 no. Verse 12 answers that question. It says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Yay! Let's join the, the Jesus team. Yay. Give me a P. Give me an E. Give me an R. Okay. No. Um, but it's reality. If you're living for the Lord, and they know you're living for the Lord, they see Christ, there's going to be people who just hate you and despise you. Right? And it's, it's often because they see Jesus. And it's like a light shining on their darkness. And the light exposes the darkness. And oftentimes, if they're not ready to repent... They feel convicted, and they just feel annoyed. You know what I'm talking about. There's some people who just, and it's not because you're mean and rude and, and stole their apple pie during lunchtime, okay? We're talking about, I should use a different analogy, but we're talking about just, they just don't like you for no reason at all. And it's often because they see Jesus. And it shouldn't take us by surprise. Verse 13, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse deceiving and being deceived. Once again, we're talking about people trying to invade the church. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you learned them. Who did they learn this from? Eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection and the instructions of Jesus. Pretty credible, huh? And we're getting this in Scripture. This is actually written to us. And this is verse 15. And that from childhood... You have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. In other words, these Scriptures are powerful, and they uh, direct us to Christ. The Word of God, all throughout it, Genesis to Revelations, it points to Jesus. Um, and it's, it's powerful. So, we, so when we study the Word, we're in the Word, we're, we're directed. We're directed to Jesus. We're directed to Jesus. Now, how important is actually is the Scripture? Verse 16 answers that. It says, all Scripture, if you don't like absolutes, you're going to hate the rest of this verse. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. For what reason? Verse 17, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. So would you say this is pretty important? Yeah. Now, Satan will distract us to not read the Word. He doesn't want us to be in the Word because of what I just said. He doesn't like that, the the outcome. The Word gives an outcome Satan doesn't like, the transformation Satan doesn't like. But you know what else also? Sometimes we as believers can be religious about reading the Word. Okay, for example, in my life, I became real religious about it. So I'm like, oh, shoot, I've got to, I got to quickly hurry because I'm, I, I, I got to get to work. But I haven't read my Bible. Uh, but I get to do my chapter every day. So here we go. I've been this the last days, perilous times will come. Remember, we love it. Love it, love it, love it blah, 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 blah. And you say, what did you read? I says, I don't know. I was too busy reading it. <laughs> right? I think most of us have done this before, right? It's the ritual. It's the pharmaceutical thing. It's like, And God says, no, I don't want you to do ritual. I want you to have relationship. I want you to listen to me. And so you know what I say? If you don't have time to read the whole chapter because of for whatever reason, okay, you're safe, okay? Don't don't beat yourself. Um, It's not, that's not the issue. It's spending time with God. So you know what? Read two verses, maybe three verses, whatever, maybe one verse. And, And with the heart of God, speak to me. 
Meditate on that. Talk to God. You know, my, my pastor in my church, I'll be honest with you, I was, you're saying, well, was everything you said not honest? Okay, anyway. <laughs> That's a lawyer thing, so. But I remember I was talking to my pastor once, and I said, so pastor, do you, um, uh, do you listen to, you know, what Christian radio station, or do you listen to, he goes, he goes, you know, I really don't have, I really don't, I don't listen to Christian radio. And I thought, oh, I'm going to just, you know, the legalistic part of me was going to come after him, you know. And before I could say anything, he says, yeah, yeah, you know, actually, no, when I'm driving, I just, I just really spend my time, um, you know, talking to God and just really communing with the Lord. <laughs> Boy, I felt like this high. You know, because at the end of the day, the end of the day, it's, it's what? It's communing with God. And that's what the word's about. That's what prayer's about. It's communing with God. And uh, who loves us so much. Sometimes we feel like we have to be real fancy. Um, God, is, God takes us where we are. You know when, when you're, how do you feel when your little toddler says for the first time, Dada? Do you say, is that all you have to say? <laughs> I mean, really? I mean, I've gone, how many times have I changed your diaper and that's all you have to do is say, Dada? No, what do you say? You go, oh, call the relatives. He just acknowledged us. He said my name, Right? How much more do you think the Heavenly Father delights when we say Abba, when we just acknowledge him, right? We have that kind of a loving relationship if we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Verse, chapter 4, verse 1. Now, this is pretty heavy duty because he says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Would you say the next verse is pretty important? Yeah, real important. Verse 2. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. In season when you're sharing the gospel and you're seeing God work and people are coming to Jesus and you're like, oh, awesome. And then out of season, when you're sharing the gospel, and boom, you get a black eye, and there's like no response, no results. Does that happen? Yeah, it happened to the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter uh, 22 and other parts of Scripture. He's there preaching. They just don't want to tear off their cloaks and throw dust in the air, and, and they want the guy scourged and maybe killed. I mean, that's sometimes the response, but it doesn't matter the response. It's about obedience. Whether we, we see the Lord moving or we don't see the Lord moving, and we're planting seed, be faithful. Preach the word in season and out of season, even when it's not popular, even when you lose your job because of it, even when you're mocked in, at school or you're booted out of a college. Um, be faithful with what God's given you. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all, oh, here it comes again, long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Well, I'm so glad we don't have that today. No. It's everywhere. You have entire denominations in the last just a few decades historic proportions, splitting down the middle between those that believe that the Bible is God's word and that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but through faith in Jesus, and, that, and those who are teaching other things that tickle the ear and make people feel good. And it's massive. And this is a, a war, a spiritual war that's taking place that was prophesied to take place, and we're experiencing it as we speak. Verse 5, but you... Um, be watchful in all things. Be watchful in all things. Oftentimes, we as Christians can be, uh, there's two extremes. One is where we can be um, so heavenly minded, we're no worldly good, earthly good. Have you heard that phrase before? Where we're just like, oh, and we're just like, no, I don't want to know what's going on. I'm just going to think about Jesus. You know, I'm not going to be aware of what's, God wants us to be watchful in all things. So we can know, pray, we can intercede, Right? Um, we can be aware of the times that we're in. 
The other example is that we can be so consumed with news that we get stressed and worried because our eyes are off Jesus. And we forget, no, I don't need to be stressed and worried. I'm going to pray that I know God is, is God and he's going to work. He's going to do his work. Right now, I believe the body of Christ, we need to be praying for people in, in the Ukraine and, and even Russian soldiers who may be believers. What I think is going to, a parent is going to be coming down in the next few days, it could be horrific. But we don't let that consume us. But yet we also are not just turning it off the world. We're still, we need, we're engaging and we're watchful. Um, and that's one reason why I really love it if, would to keep people updated because we need intercession. We have 65 cases right now as I speak in active litigation. And uh, we need to be uh, interceding and we need to be engaging. Um, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Now, when we hear this, we're probably thinking, well, that's actually for the pastor. And way to go, pastor. We're going to encourage you. Way to go. We're behind you, pastor. No, he's talking to you. Um, and there's two, just, uh, there's two questions you can answer. And this will tell you, say whether he's talking to you. Number one, do you have a, a, a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ? Are you a believer? That's the first. Second, is your heart beating? What's the third? There's no third question. Because if you know Jesus and you're alive, then he has you here for a purpose. He creates for his pleasure and for his glory. We're here for his, his purpose. And he's a, he's a compassionate God. And if he, we have no purpose for us here at all, for his pleasure, for his glory, no purpose at all, he should take us home. It's much better to be with the Lord than to have to be down here. But Paul understood his purpose. We, for followers of Jesus, he has a purpose for us here. And it's to live for him and to put him and to, to follow him. Um, some people may be hearing this saying, well, yeah, 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 I get it. Doctrine, okay, right, right. But practically speaking, Brad, I don't have anything in the way of this ministry kind of thing, all right? I just, I don't pray for people. I'm not a prayer warrior. Da, 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 da. I, I, just, I, can't, I can't share my faith. Okay, for those of you who are still in denial that God can work through you, here's a little story about a 16-year-old boy. He'd given his life to Jesus, and um, he was driving to school one day in his little Opal GT, it's like a Corvette, only smaller and cheaper, okay? So he's driving up this hill um, on this Texas highway, and this motorcyclist is passing cars. As he's approaching up the, up the hill, the motorcycle hits him head on. The motorcycle goes smashing right through his windshield and smashes through his skull. All right, it's a very gruesome accident. He's rushed to the ICU at a hospital, Parkland General Hospital, and the doctor tells his parents, your son has had major brain damage. Even if he lives, he still could be a vegetable. You may still have to pull the cord, end quote. As far as the world was concerned, this boy and his future was in the trash, only to be pitied for what could have been. And yet, Californians, our God is a great recycler. And he loves to take that which the world throws away and do something new. And he did that with this young boy. Because of his grace and mercy, this young boy had a tremendous, miraculous healing. Uh, using that left frontal lobe that was smashed in, which deals with logic, reasoning, analytical thinking, speech communications. This young boy got his degree in business finance, a 3.86 in his major, put himself through undergrad, worked two years, then went to one of the top 20 law schools in the country, graduated the top half of his class. And I know this kid really well because it's me. And the reason I'm sharing this, <laughs> praise God, And the reason I'm sharing this, um, in fact, my whole left side here has been all reconstructed. I've got hip bone grafting where the, the cheek is. I really mess up that song, you know, the, anyway. Um, <laughs> so we, and then the, you know, silicon, 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 wires, reattachment, reattach the job. This has all been redone. But um, the reason I'm sharing this is not so you'll say, oh, that's the Lord's special warrior. The Lord has anointed him for verily, verily. Okay, stop the verilies. Um, Talk to my wife. She'll tell you after 20 years of marriage, my halo is still really crooked, okay? <laughs> but is that the way it is for all of us, though? None of us have it all together. But that's where God's grace and forgiveness and mercy, that's where the, the Holy Spirit, he's working on us. And God wants to work through us right where we are. 
Not because of who we are, but because of whose we are if we've given our lives to Jesus Christ. Life becomes exciting with purpose and meaning and dimension and adventure when we walk with the Lord and we've surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ. And what he's going to do, it's all about him. Verse 6, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. He's being a little eloquent. What he's saying is, I'm about to die, okay? I'm about to die for Jesus. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. You know what I like about this? He didn't say, I saw at least 100 people come to Jesus. I founded several churches. I did. It's not about results, because that's God. God's the one who does results. He just calls us to be obedient. And that's what this verse is about, is, is run the race and be followers of Jesus and not give up. Not give up. He never gives up on us. And we should not give up on what he wants to do through us. In verse 8, this is the final verse. And uh, I'm also getting hungry, so. <laughs> I do that intermittent fasting thing, and your metabolism, it just really causes you to get hungry, so I'm just telling you. Although I cheated before this service, so I, I, I'm, I'm moving on. Verse 8. Finally, and he means finally, okay, because he's about to go. He says, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. Now, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Paul, I'm sorry. I know what your name used to be. Saul. You were the Osama bin Laden of the early church. There's a reason no one invited you to, to Wednesday night Bible studies or scriptures, because um, you would take them, men and women, and put them in prison. And you helped the first martyr become a martyr. You, you held the robes of those who threw this to stone uh, Stephen. So you're going to get the crown of righteousness? How do you figure that one? And it's simple, because Paul knew that his righteousness was not from Paul, but through faith in Jesus Christ dying on the cross for all of his sin. He put his trust in Jesus. And because Jesus separates all the sin in our life from the east is from the west, because he bore it on the cross completely, unequivocally. Now, does that apply to us? Let's continue with that verse. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. I like this word, loved his appearing, because it's, it's a heart question, right? I mean, we may have, maybe we went to uh, confirmation at some time in our life. Uh, maybe we went to confession, did communion, uh, didn't to church camp. Maybe we said a prayer sometime. But, but this goes to the heart, whether or not we're real in our faith, whether or not we really have put our faith and hope in Jesus. Um, and so let me just give you a hypothetical. Let's say that tomorrow at exactly 1.30, this is hypothetical. No one knows the day or the hour. I get that. Okay. All right. I'm always often corrected when I use this, analogy, this hypo. So, but let's just say tomorrow at 1.30 exactly, we know for one, some reason, we know that Jesus is coming back tomorrow at 1.30. What would you be thinking? Most believers would be, awesome. Oh, I got to call out Myrtle. I don't know if she knows the Lord. I got to call, you know, it's like, It'd be better than Disneyland on steroids. I mean, it's just like, whoa, so awesome. However, there's going to be some people, probably here, who are going to be saying, oh, shoot. I don't know if I'm going to be going. I don't know if he's going to take me. And one of the reasons may be you're, you're saying to yourself, and no one may, around may know this, but you're saying to yourself, I've got this dark closet. And... And it's, it's so bad. By the way, everyone has a dark closet, just for the record, okay? We all have shame. We all have shame. But you say, no, no, no. I have a really dark closet, and it's so shameful. How could God forgive me for this? Because I can't even forgive myself. You know what we're doing? It's like walking up to Jesus Christ on the cross. And just picture him on the cross right there. Dying on the cross, bleeding in pain and agony, and we walk up to him and we say, nice try, Jesus. But you see, for me, that's just not good enough. 
And I believe his, that lie was, sat, was answered to when he said on the cross, it is finished. And all we have to do in humility is to believe it, to believe that he died on the cross for our sins and surrender our lives for him. And he will separate our sin as far as the east is from the west and we will become a child of the living God with an eternity and in salvation with God and a whole new life. And it's right here, right now. And all you need to do is to respond. And if you felt the Holy Spirit, when I just shared that, hitting your heart, that wasn't me. That's the Holy Spirit and giving you an opportunity right now to receive Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.